Hey, as we start, um, I want to almost draw back on, on something we talked about last week at the start of our time this morning. Last week, as we celebrated Fourth of July, we talked about the church that America needs. And we talked about some principles out of a passage in Second Chronicles. One of those principles is that America needs a praying church. And uh, it's, it's not escaped any of us that this has not been our best week as a country. It's been a very difficult week, a uh, very violent week, and uh, a lot of people have uh, and a lot of hurt and anger, and I think one thing we see above all is the presence of hate in the world around us in a lot of different ways. And it's been a tough week on our country, so I thought it'd be fitting uh, just for us to stop and pray uh, as a church uh, for our country and for the leaders and for those who are are going to be having difficult jobs this week in light of everything that's happened. Um, so let's just pause for a moment and say a word of prayer, and then we'll get into uh, our teaching time for this week. Uh, Lord, we thank you for today. Um, we do thank you for this great country we live in. Um, and God, I just uh, as we've watched the news all week long, we've seen that this is not the world you created, and things are not as you intended them to be. Um, God, we... Uh, just ask that you would be uh, with us as a country this week, um, be with the different cities that are experiencing hurt and unrest and pain. Um, God, I just pray that uh, you would be uh, bring just a sense of healing and peace into so many lives that are troubled um, this week in, in different ways. God, I ask that you would um, be with our leaders, that they would know um, the best way to, to direct and to lead us. I'm um, into a better day as a country and be with our churches, that they would bring a sense of strength and a sense of love um, into our country and, and be a, an example of you to a world who desperately needs to encounter you. It's in your name we pray. Amen. So, uh, like, I, uh, like I said last week, and, and I believe I will always think this, that this is one of the best times there is to be the church. Uh, because our chance for impact and our chance to um, prop up Jesus to the world around us and put him on display has never been better. And uh, this week highlights how badly um, the world around us needs to experience the love and the hope that a relationship with Jesus Christ offers. Uh, today, as we look at our time, uh, we will be looking at a parable that centers around prayer. Uh, you can turn in your Bibles if you'd like to Luke chapter 11. Uh, the, today, our parable is one of the shortest parables we'll study, just a few verses. But the things Jesus has to say before and after that parable are incredibly powerful. And again, today we simply focus on prayer. Now, one thing I've talked about throughout the years, I just wanted us as a church to, to aim to see how much we could deepen our faith, to make 2016 a year of spiritual growth. And there's been a lot of things along the way uh, we have done to emphasize that and to bring that to the forefront of our minds. Well, talking about prayer is part of that. Because I know, I know if there's just a couple things we're going to do in our lives to focus on our relationship with the Lord, prayer's got to be one of them. Your know, prayer's a unique opportunity to where we get to speak with the most powerful person in the universe, the creator of the universe, the person that knows the most, in the universe, we also get to speak to the person that cares more about us than anyone will ever know. What a great and awesome opportunity. But unfortunately, sometimes we don't leverage that. Sometimes we just kind of take that for granted. And instead of maximizing that potential or really grabbing hold of that opportunity, we just pass it by or we don't remind ourselves to pray sometimes like we should. And my hope is that as we work through our story this morning, it will simply serve as a reminder of the need to pray, but also how great of an opportunity it is to pray. The story, it's, it's short and it's very simple. It's about a, a friend or a neighbor. And he had some guests come into town, but he found himself with nothing to feed them. Now today, that would be minorly inconvenient, but we could solve the problem. It's a much, much bigger deal in the time to where Jesus ministered in the time that Jesus told the story. So in the middle of the night, he goes to his neighbor's house, and he knocks on the door, hoping to get some food. 
None of us would really want to be woken up in the middle of the night to give someone else something to eat. Some of us have had our kids wake us up in the middle of the night for something to eat. We didn't really like that either, even though they were ours and lived in our house. We'd feel so much stronger about it if a neighbor came and knocked on our door, but, but one of our characters goes to his neighbor's house in the middle of the night and asks him for something to eat. And what we'll see is because of his attitude and it is the intensity that he has, his neighbor will grant that request. Not because he loves him, not because it's a worthy thing to do, simply because of the mindset of the individual who was so bold to go knock on a door in the middle of the night to help feed his guests. And throughout that and through some of the teaching that Jesus does, after he tells the parable, we learn some key things about prayer and the role it ought to play in our daily living. The first lesson we learn is that our needs are real. The needs in our life are real. They matter to us and they matter to God. Let's read uh, verse, uh, again, Luke chapter 11. We're going to read verses 5 through 6. And here it's written, And he said to them, Which of you who has a friend will go to him at midnight and say to him, Friend, lend me three loaves? For a friend of mine has arrived on a journey, and I have nothing to set before him. This, young, this gentleman, he had a real need. Our needs are real too. When we look at this, this time frame, when Jesus taught, if we could have sat there and lived in the day that the hearers heard this, if we lived at this time, we would understand this maybe differently than we would today as we hear it or as we read it. One thing we would recognize is in that time frame, hospitality was a cultural mandate. It was an absolute must. Uh, today, we often, sometimes we'll look at someone and say they have the gift of hospitality. They have a, a, a special ability just to make people feel at home when they come to their house. I've got an aunt who lives in Oklahoma City, which was about 30 minutes from where I attended college, and she has the gift of hospitality. And throughout college, I ate my weight in her chocolate chip cheesecake and chicken fried steak. But she has a way of making anyone who comes into her house feel at home. Today, hospitality is a gifting. Some people, it's something they strive for, they've worked hard at. They value that. When Jesus told this story, it's expected of everybody. That if someone comes into your house, you're to give them the best experience possible. You're to make them feel like the king of the world when they're in your home. So if you have company that comes to your house and you don't have anything to feed them, it's not an inconvenience, it's shameful. Because you're not doing what the world requires of you or what is expected of you in that time frame. So as, as, the, as the audience hears this, they go, oh no. This is em how embarrassing for this guy to have company and not be able to feed him. Second thing is, food's not readily, readily available in this time. Today, food's very, very accessible. Not so much when Jesus told this story. You know, Gwen and I, we enjoy hosting people, and, and when we can get our schedules to match for a free evening, it's common that we'll invite uh, family over, that family will come through, or friends in the area will come over to dinner. And we enjoy that, so... Take a night like tonight, where we've been gone uh, and very gone this weekend, very busy before that. Our cupboards are a little bare, fridge is a little empty. We have family come by or someone swings through unexpected around dinner time. It's not really that big a deal. We'll run down to Price Chopper, we'll order a pizza, have something delivered, or we'll just all load up and go out to dinner. You just can't do that in, in the time where Jesus told this story. Food's not readily available. So it's not like our, care, our gentleman has an easy solution. He can't just go grab something. And this day you baked pretty much, in, you, you typically baked, baked enough bread to feed your family for that day. And the next day you'd repeat the same process. So not only does he have a need of feeding his guests, but he doesn't really have a way to, to fill it. He can't just go solve the problem. 
But the audience, as they heard this, they recognized this guy's really in a pinch. He's got a real life need that needs solving. And what we have to recognize about our own lives when it comes to prayer is we have needs. There are things going on in our life that are real. And they matter to us and they matter to God, so we might as well take the time to talk to Him about it. We've got to recognize that we have needs in our life that are worthy of being prayed on. Yeah, have you ever watched someone struggle through something and refuse to ask for help? I sure have. You probably have too. Uh, I've mentioned before in different settings how strong Gwen is, my wife. Now, she's very emotionally strong. She's very durable. Uh, she's very mentally strong. She can handle a lot mentally. But she is outright incredibly physically strong. Uh, she goes to a gym and she does a particular workout routine. And it's common that she'll come home after her workout, and I'll say, hey, Gwenny, how was, how was your workout? She said it was great. I lifted more weight than all the girls and half the guys. I said, that's great. And a couple weeks ago, on a particular day, she went up, and she had the goal of lifting more on a particular lift than she had ever lifted before. And she did it. On this particular lift, she had to get it from the ground up to right about here, and she did that with over 200 pounds. I was real proud of her. And then the next day, after lifting so much weight, we're standing in the kitchen, and she can't get the pickle jar open. <laughs> and I said, hey, babe, you need some help? No. <laughs> Struggling through a situation, when she finally handed me the pickle jar, I opened it up with no problem, but refused to ask for help refuse to talk to me about it and sometimes I think that's what God is like watching us struggle through something thinking to himself I could help I could fix it I could solve your problem or at least give you the solution but you won't even talk to me about it you won't even reach out to me about it church the things going on in our lives God can help God's got an answer. He's got a solution. Or he can put our mind at ease. But we've got to be willing to talk to him about it. You know, I think there's a couple things that we kind of battle in our minds that can prevent us from praying. One is the mentality of, I've got it. Sometimes we'll look at a situation and think, I don't need to pray about this. I already know what to do. I know how to solve this problem. I can handle this on my own. Yeah, this relationship isn't going real well. But I can fix it. I know what to do. I've got it. And we don't always consciously make that decision. We don't, we don't necessarily come to a point and say, okay, am I, pray, am I going to pray about it? Or am I just going to go fix it on my own? Sometimes without even thinking, we, we decide not to pray about it. That we'll just go solve the problem or address the situation all on our own. We've got to understand in many of the situations we face in life, we don't have it. And we need God's help, or we need God's advice, or we need God's comfort that only He can provide. And He's willing to step in and be a part of that situation. Sometimes God's just waiting for the invitation to come be a part, and the invitation to come help out with what we're struggling through or what we're facing in our lives. I think the second thing that can prevent us from praying is the thought that, eh, this is too small to bother God with. It's too small of an issue to really pray about. Because God's not concerned with these small of details in my life. And I don't think that's true. I think God cares about everything on our mind and on our hearts. And he already knows it. So we might as well talk to him about it. There's nothing too small. There's no concern we have that God looks at and thinks, why would you even waste my time bringing that up? If it matters to us, it matters to him, which should make it a matter worth praying about. Now, sure, there's things going on in our life that we pray about for a minute, contrasted with things going on in our lives that we may pray about for hours. But there's nothing so small that it's outside of God's realm of concern or care. He cares about all the details 
in our life, big or small. So the first thing we, we learn, or I want us to take away from our parable today, is that our needs are real. The second thing I want us to take, take away is that God honors bold requests. In Luke 11, our passage today, 7 through 12, it, it reads, And he will answer from within, Do not bother me. The, the door is now shut, and my children are in, in bed. I cannot get up and give you anything. I tell you, though he will not get up and give him anything because he is his friend, yet because of his impudence, he will rise and give him whatever he needs. And I tell you, ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and the one who seeks finds, and the one who knocks it will be open. What, uh, what father among you, if his son asks for a fish, will instead of a fish give him a serpent? Or, or if he asks for an egg, will give him a scorpion? So as we read, our, read that chunk of text, we recognize that, that God honors bold requests. That this friend, the, the neighbor, was going to grant the request... For food was going to lend him the three loaves he was asking for, not because he's a good neighbor, not because he's a good friend, but because he's going to grant the bold request or the the potent request of his friend. You know, when I read this story, I was reminded of uh, of actually another story I was told. I was sitting in a church financial meeting, a seminar meeting, a couple years ago. And the story was told about a, a pastor who was leading his church through a capital campaign or a fundraiser to add on space to their building. The church was out of room, and it wasn't going to grow if they didn't have more space. So it was an important moment in the life of the church. The story was told this pastor, in the process of leading his church through that, he went out to play golf with a good friend of his who was also a member of this church, uh, this particular member had done very well financially. Uh, God had blessed his business. And he, this gentleman was able to make some very large contributions to causes that, that he cared about, to things that were important to him. And he's playing golf with this pastor, and uh, they were good enough friends that they could talk about money. And most of us realize, you know, you got to be kind of a good friend to talk about your checkbook. Uh, you don't do that with just everybody. But... This gentleman, he's sharing with the pastor how he had just made a, a very sizable contribution to the local hospital, who was also adding on space. And the pastor, as the story is told, his, his demeanor changed uh, pretty significantly. His friend said, what's wrong? You look upset or bothered. And the pastor said, well, you knew we were raising these funds. Why didn't you give it to your church instead of the hospital? The, his friend, the businessman, said, I thought you had it. You never asked. And, you know, I think there's a lot of things God would do and a lot of prayers he would answer that we just simply haven't asked yet. And one, one reason that God doesn't move or there are situations in our life to where God doesn't step in, not because he can't, not because he doesn't want to, but because we've not been willing to pray a bold prayer or make a big ask of God. To really say, God, I need you to come in and do something only you can do. The parable today shows us that God's willing to answer a really, really bold request. Now, there's some things about our passage today that make what the neighbor asked for a really bold request. You know, we think of three loaves a day's su supply of bread. That's a big deal in this world, but that in and of itself is not bold. That's a reasonable thing to ask for, is some food. But how many of you have received a call or a knock on the door at midnight? It's not a pleasant thing. None of us want to be woken up. And in this day... Uh, the, uh, the homes were almost all one room. So everything was all together, meaning that all the family 
was in one, one, one area, and when you knock on the door, you took the risk of waking up the children. Now, how many of you as a parent have struggled through bedtime and would have done anything to make sure that child didn't get disturbed in his sleep or that child didn't get woken up? Most of us have. So think about you, you're lying there, you've gotten the kids to sleep, and then your neighbor comes knocking on the door, wanting you to rummage through the house and give him some food so that he can uphold the cultural expectation. That's what makes the bold, the request so bold. Not just what he asked for, but the timing in which he did it. In fact, if we took it back down to the Greek, the... Um, the word that, that Luke would have initially used really combined two different characteristics that, that described the, the, the question that one neighbor was asking. It, it included the boldness, but also the shamelessness. And that's, I think, what God is looking for in our prayer life, a willingness to say, God, I'm going to ask you to do something that only you can do, and I'm not going to be embarrassed about it. I'm not going to be ashamed about it because I know you're willing to do it. And as Luke clearly spells out, the one neighbor will in fact get up. He'll risk waking up the family. He'll disrupt his schedule, not because he loves his neighbor, but because he's honored by how bold the request is. And I think we've got to use that as a model for our own lives that we've got to be willing to ask God for things that only He can do and not be embarrassed about it. We've got to look at our own lives and say, God, I, need a, I really need you to work in this relationship. And if you don't, I don't know that this relationship will last. God, I really need you to work in my finances. And if you don't, I don't see how the ends are going to meet. God, I've got this situation at work. I've got this problem with my health. God, I've got these issues going on. And if you don't do something, I just don't see how this can turn out. And I think God's honored by that. I know in my own life, sometimes I feel out of turn asking God to do something big on my behalf. But I don't think he wants it to be that way. I think he really wants us to come from him, come to him, and give him the invitation to do something that only he can do on our behalf. And let him show off a bit in our own lives. But one thing, the second thing we learn from our parable today is that we don't need to feel sheepish about what we ask God to do. We don't need to be embarrassed when we ask God to do something major in our lives. To step in in a huge way. We need to recognize that he wants to honor our most courageous and our most aggressive requests that we can make of him. The third thing I want us to walk away with is that we can trust God's answer. We can trust his answer. So we read the end of the passage. Uh, it says, what, a, what, a father, what father among you, if his son asks for a fish, will instead of a fish give him a serpent? Or if he asks for an egg, will give him a scorpion? If you then who are evil know how much to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask Him? Now as Jesus teaches at the end of the parable, He calls on our parenting a little bit. He uses a relationship that many of us are familiar with. He says, look, what earthly father gives his son or daughter a snake? when he asks for a fish. Or he gives them a scorpion when they ask for an egg. And what Jesus is trying to drive home is that we can trust his answer. When we pray, when we ask things of God, we can trust his answer. Now sometimes, earthly parents, they give us reasons to mistrust him. We're out camping this weekend with my in-laws. Eli had made a sandwich. Eli hates mustard. So while Eli's goofing off with his grandparents, Gwen puts mustard on a corner of his sandwich. 
And then he comes back and takes a bite, and it's this dramatic thing because there's mustard on his sandwich. But he got a couple Oreos for giving us some entertainment. So it really still worked out well for him. Uh, we can't, sometimes we can't trust different sources in our lives, but we can always trust God's answer. When we pray, we can trust that he's going to give us the best result according to what he knows and understands, not necessarily according to what we know or we want. You know, I, I've, been, I've heard it said that, that God answers our prayers in one of three ways, yes, no, or wait. And I, I don't very often like to say, well, this is what God does. Because God's God, and I've found in my own life, God does what he wants. Um, he's, he has that right. But I do think there's some wisdom in that, that God gives us the best result. And sometimes when we ask something of us, the best result is yes. Sometimes it's no. Sometimes it's wait. Think back to the parenting uh, illustration that Jesus drew on. Sometimes we tell our kids yes. Now one thing that I appreciate about my childhood is that when I ran errands with my dad, I almost always got a snack. I loved it. it. It was something you could depend on. So if dad was at home on a Saturday morning and said, hey, I, I got to go to the store. Who wants to go? I was like, yeah, I want to go. I'll get a donut or I'll get a, a cheeseburger or something. So I passed that along to my kids. And now if my kids run an errand with me, they almost always get to stop by Quick Trip and get a slushy, or by Dunkin' Donuts or McDonald's or something along the line. I remember one time uh, Eli was he was a little guy, two, three years old, and we went into a gas station that we went at a lot in that community we were living in, and there was, they had there a line of dot, like dollar and under snacks, and uh, very unhealthy, not the snacks I probably should have been feeding my child, according to the good parenting standards, but they were cheap, so that's what I fed them. And I remember one Saturday morning, I'm getting my diet, my diet Mountain Dew, and uh, he passes by the dollar snack rack. And I'm thinking, where's this kid think he's going? But he passes by, and he goes and he picks up a pack of trail mix, which was off the $2 rack. But it was a much healthier alternative. And he came up and said, Dad, can I have this? And I thought, of course you can. It's a much better thing for you than what I originally had in mind. And sometimes when we ask something of God, he gets to say yes, because that the question we're asking or the thing we're praying about, well, it's in line with his, his heart or his plan for our lives. Sometimes God says no. You know, when a child's playing in the street, we don't say, I love them so much, I want them to do whatever they want. I'll just let them play in the street. We correct that. Sometimes we ask things of God or we pray a certain way and God says, I love you, but that's not what's best for you. So I can't grant that request right now. I've got to say no to that one. And sometimes he says, wait. Sometimes he says, wait. Because I've got something better in mind. You know, if we're driving with a child and, and we're going to take them out for a nice dinner, a steak dinner or or a restaurant that we know they'll enjoy, well, if they start asking for McDonald's, we may say no. Not because we, don't w we want them to be unhappy, but because we know there's something better out there. And God gets to be the exact same way. Sometimes he gets to say, just hold on a minute. I know you see this. I know you think this is what's best, and I appreciate that you'll bring it to me. I appreciate the time you're spending in prayer. But I've got something better in mind, so just hold on. And it's not a yes, it's not a no, it's just be patient and give me time to bring something better into your lives. You know, today we get to read where Jesus just teaches us on prayer. And what I always remember is that as Jesus teaches on prayer, he also modeled it because he spent a lot of his time in his ministry taking a step back or taking a morning away or a night away just to pray, just to spend time with his heavenly father. And it always says to me, okay, if Jesus needed to do that, how much more do I need to do that in my life? And if it, 
if it's important to me, then I need to make that a priority. Or if it's important in my mind or in my heart, I need to make it a priority in my schedule. And as we pray or as we think on prayer, prayer, Jesus teaches us today a few things that we need to expect or a few things we need to remember about the time we spend in prayer. So in just a moment, Pastor Don's going to come up and uh, lead us in our time of response. And just one thing that that kind of crossed my mind is, is just a way to evaluate my prayer life, and maybe it'll work for you as well, is just to, over the next few weeks, a couple times, just make a list of the top five things you're thinking about, or the top three things on your mind, and then make a list of the top three or five things that you're praying about, and just see if, see if the two match. And that'll maybe be an indicator to you. Maybe you'll say, you know, there's some things that are important to me that I'm not praying about, and we'll know a little more how to use prayer as part of our daily living. So uh, I'll close this out in a word of prayer. We'll enter into our time of response. As Don leads, I'm always available. I would love to visit with you on uh, anything that's on your mind or on your heart, uh, but you can also sit right there and, and, and pray and talk to God right where you're at. You wouldn't need me at all. So I'll pray, and then Don will lead us in our time of response. Lord, we just thank you so much for today and for all you're doing um, in our lives and in our church. I just ask that you would be with us as we go into our our Sunday school classes. Be with us as we uh, continue on throughout the end of our service. We just thank you for today, uh, for all you're doing. And and may, uh, may the story we read and the lessons we learned just be a reminder to us about the importance of spending time just talking to you about the things going on in our lives. It's in your name we pray. Amen.